Give the Lord a big shout of praise. Hallelujah. It's truly really an honor to be here. And I'm sure the Lord will visit us in an extraordinary way in Jesus' name. In the precious name of Jesus. I want to sincerely honor our Father, the lead apostle over this house, God's servant, Apostle Dr. Tony Rappu. It's an honor to be here. I don't take it for granted. And I also sincerely want to honor God's servant, Pastor Jude. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate you so much for your commitment to the work of God. Hallelujah. I appreciate the entire leadership for your corporate effort to see what God is doing, this great work God is doing here. I, I think I've followed part of the work from this present house. And one of the most remarkable is the fact that um, God's servant has the grace and the heart to pick people from the gutters and turn them to champions. Sometimes when you watch these clips, they are sincerely, sincerely amazing. And you can see the liquid love of Jesus and the ex extraordinary grace for transformation at work. And I'm happy to be here this afternoon to share fellowship with you in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for the privilege to share with your people. Thank you because, again, you will open the vistas of heaven to grant us access into realms of illumination, even as we draw from your spirit and on the strength of that, advance the frontiers of your kingdom and your glory upon the face of the earth. Help us this afternoon, Father, to go into deeper spheres of intimacy and to touch things that are eternal, even as we are transformed and invigorated thereby. Take all the praise, take all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, I'll begin immediately. I know you've been drinking so much, but I want to believe you are not tired. I want to believe you are hungry for much more. The Bible said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion that appeared before the Lord. He said times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Father. So we don't get exhausted in God's presence. We get invigorated in God's presence. Hallelujah. And so I believe somebody is really, really getting invigorated even as this procession has been on for several hours now. And it's only going to get better in Jesus' name. Can you touch some strings for me? Touch some sound and help me ascend. <laughs> it's a burden to talk from your brain. Our brain is too limited to touch eternal realities. And so many times we take advantage of the access that we have in the Holy Ghost to touch things that are chronicled in the layers of Zion. You know, the things that help our navigation in time, they are immortal. And until we can touch those immortal things, we are defeated on ground. And one of the vehicles of transport in the spirit is sound. Sound. Sound is not for pleasure. It's for transport. He said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And the Holy Ghost glided on that sound. It was on the strength of that sound that they entered Zion. <laughs> he said, it will descend with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. So whenever there is sound, spirits are mobilized. So mobilize me with sound. Mobilize me. <laughs> Mete imako una, mete imako una, mete imako una, mete imako una, bazanji zoroba, mete imako una, mete imako una, bazanji kunya ba. Metei makona, metei makona. Metei makona, metei makona. Metei makona, metei makona. Oh, metei makona. Aini bazanje toro ba. Metei makona, metei makona. 
Bazanji kunya ba Mete makona 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 Aini bazanji toroba Mete makona Mete makona Mazanji kunyama Mete makona Mete makona You may be seated God bless you Let's begin from Matthew from Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 You know it's a body when you have to minister after patriarchs skilled technocrats after they've done all they have to do you now come to minister so i'm wondering why Jude asked me to come now they they would have exhausted syllables you don't know where to start from it's a body i will just check my spirit anything the holy ghost drops i will draw out i don't know what you teach on a subject when someone like pastor koju oyemade has taught what do you now teach these are technocrats with scriptures they build scriptures like they are architects the intelligence with scripture the dexterity is something else and then to make it more difficult apostle selma has minister imagine where you left me god will help us god will help us so genesis 128 i just want to touch a few things he said and god blessed them god wanted to open the body in his heart and the very factor that necessitated the creation of man because before god began to create there were many things god represented before he became a creator everything we know about god are the things that he engrafted into the syllables of his being as creator but in god when there was no time when all the references that were was god there were many things god represented it's a mistake to think that god is creator and begin to interact with him purely as creator he is bigger than creator because before creation was he was he is older than creation creation is just one expression of the multifaceted realities that he represents before he ever began creation he was but you see now that he has created and he has created men it was necessary for him to open the understanding of men to know why it was necessary to create them because before he created men he had created other spirits there were many communities and many civilizations going on in the spirit before god decided to create man in fact if you study genesis chapter 1 from verse 26 it said god said let us make man that was the first community that was because the first community that ever was existed in god it was a community of the father the son and the spirit and where they dwelt was in god because you see it is only creator creation that requires external environment god does not need an environment god is god's environment god lives in god because there was nothing before god you know when paul was speaking he said that god dwells in light unapproachable in 1 timothy 6:16 and peter john was teaching in john chapter 1 verse 5 and he said god is light he said this is the message that we have received from him that he is light and in him is no darkness so god is light and god dwells in light so what it means is that god lived in god so the first community that ever existed was the community of the godhead and that community was governed by three perfect realities the will of the father the wisdom of the father and the power of the father this is why 
the first revelation of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 was almighty, Elohim. Because you can't define God apart from power. And you can also not walk in the realm of God without aligning to his will. And when you function by God's power and in God's will, then you are operating in God's wisdom. So God's civilization was governed by his will, his power, and his wisdom. And this God existed in himself, a community of three beings that at the same time is one. And so before anything was, they related with themselves as a perfect community, existing in perfect harmony. But a point came where the love of God began to propel God to create an environment outside of himself. And so God went on an adventure of creation. That was when God became a creator. But when the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were relating together before creation ever was, God was. And there are many things God represents that we don't know of. But when he decided to start creating, he began to create different ecosystems regulated by different re realities. And so before he came to man, there was the angelic order. That was the first external environment he created. It was actually a spirit realm. Because he said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he created the spirit realm. There was a realm that was unseen before he decided to create the seen realm. Now, this unseen realm also has many civilizations in it because of how vast God is. You have elders. What does a spirit do to become an elder? If a spirit, the age of a spirit is not judged by time, what then makes a spirit an elder? That is to tell you about the nature of their civilization. Those who are called elders are the custodians of the secrets of God. And so when you enter the community of the elders, what regulates their civilization is their access to the secrets of God. If you study the Bible, when John went to heaven, the Bible said John was weeping in heaven. Because when the, the outcome of human existence was judged, it looked as if there was no hope. And a strong angel actually appeared and told John that there was no hope. And John began to weep. But suddenly, say, one of the elders came to him and said, weep not. That angel is a strong angel, but it's not ancient. He said, we have access to secrets. Our civilization is regulated by secrets. He said, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he had prevailed. Meanwhile, what the elder was saying was in the past. A strong angel didn't see it in the future. So what defines the realm of the elders are the secrets they have. So in that civilization, what gives you legality to function there are the kinds of secrets you can be entrusted with. Now, apart from the realm of elders, there are other angelic functionaries that we can't talk about. But I said that to let you know that every creation God ever embarked upon to create, there were codes that define their reality. And so when God came to man in Genesis 1.26, he began to show man why he was created. Because it's possible for the man to start loafing around the Garden of Eden and not know why he was created in the first place. And so God spoke from verse 26. He said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. And he said, let them have dominion. You know, it's easy to discuss the dominion mandate and begin to talk about the dynamics and the realms of dominion. Most times when you hear teaching on dominion or the dominion mandate, the emphasis are on the dynamics of dominion or the realms that we should dominate. But we don't go to the foundation to find out the qualifications of the spirit that sustains or gives a man the right to exercise dominion. And so many times, you send people to different spheres, but they can't bring dominion. Because dominion is not to populate the realm. We can have people in government. It doesn't mean dominion. We can have people in the market. It doesn't mean dominion. In fact, they can be doing well. It still doesn't mean dominion. We can have all the richest men in the world today becoming Christian. It doesn't mean dominion. 
All the government officials in Nigeria today can be Christians. It doesn't mean dominion. Because dominion is not popularization of territories or spheres. There is something that must be at the foundation before our populating different spheres can become dominion. And so when God was dealing with the man, those were the articles he began to present to the man. But before I go into those articles, let me just list out the dynamics of dominion and then the spheres of dominion. So that we will have that in mind before I go to the foundation. So in Genesis 1, 28, God outlined the dynamics of dominion. And this is what God said. He said, concerning the man, he said he blessed them. So the first thing that makes for dominion is blessing. If there is no blessing on your life, you will labor in futility. Because blessing, the word blessing means to cause, to prosper. And so, when you are an, an agent of dominion, the spirit you represent, which is actually the cardinal essence of dominion, the cardinal essence of dominion is the ability to put the blueprint of a spirit on what you are doing. It's the ability to put the blueprint of a spirit in the sphere where you are. And so for that to happen, that spirit must put his endorsement upon your life. So the blessing is actually the endorsement of the spirit of God upon the man that he has created. And then after the blessing, God went to the second aspect of the dynamic. And he said to be fruitful. He said to multiply. He said to replenish and to subdue the earth. So if you are not fruitful, if you are not multiplying, if you are not replenishing and if you are not subduing, you can never have dominion. So the two things that form the dynamics of dominion is number one, the blessing and number two, the multiplicative factor that the spirit puts in a man. When these two things are in place, wherever a man finds himself, he will always dominate. Now, when you are done with the dynamics, then you go to the spheres. And God also outlined the spheres in this scripture. He said, number one, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. So God gave man the jurisdiction for his dominion. And I will tell you why God stopped here. Because this is not the total jurisdiction of dominion. But this jurisdiction was what God allocated to the man who did not have the spirit in him yet. Because the man that God was talking to here had not eaten of the tree of life. The Holy Ghost was not yet on his inside. So at this point, his jurisdiction was the waters, the earth, and the air. Now, if you read this same scripture again, after the man received the Holy Spirit, the scope increased to the spirit realm as well. Because when Jesus sent the man, he sent him to all nations. Genesis, Matthew 28 verse 18. He said, go into all the worlds. And Paul came to elaborate all the worlds. Not to mean all the nations only, but also the spirit realm. Because in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10, he said, having done all to stand, stand therefore. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So you saw that from Genesis 1, 28 to Matthew 28, verse 18 to Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10 to verse 18, the scope of man's dominion was the waters, the earth, the air, and the spirit realm. And the reason the spirit realm was added is because we now operate in the order of the second Adam. And the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. And so if we are operating in the authority of the Lord from heaven, then even the heavenly realms also becomes a sphere where we can exercise dominion. Jesus himself speaking, he said, when two or three of you are gathered together in my name, he said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. So our impact extends from the earth realm to the heavenly realm. So two things that is usually emphasized about dominion is the dynamics and is also the, the realms. But dominion is more organic than just the dynamic and the realms. So my teaching this morning is going to focus more 
on the organic dimension of dominion because we are looking at the dominion mandate. If we want to talk about the dominion mandate, we can just talk about carrying the will of God to the different spheres through the dynamics that God gives. So when you are able to exercise the will of God in different spheres, you are carrying out dominion. But you cannot exercise the will of God unless you become the will of God. That's where above the dynamics and above the sphere, something must happen before a person or a people can exercise the dominion mandate. When I'm rounding up, I will define the dominion mandate and then we'll trust God to pray. But there were five things that God gave to the man before God came to Genesis 1.28. And those five things are the foundations of the dominion mandate. If you don't have those five things, you may know the dominion mandate. You may preach it, but you will never exercise it. If you don't know these five things, we may mass produce people. Send them to politics, send them to media, send them to the economy. But we will not see the dominion mandate. In fact, as we are speaking now, there is no sphere or strata in Nigeria that there are no Christians. The last dispensation that everybody is writing off. Yes, most of the leaders are from the other faction. But I can assure you that there were good number of Christians in that same dispensation. But we didn't see the dominion. And in case you want to argue it at the national level, there are some states in Nigeria that are Christian states. They all come to church on Sunday. But we didn't see dominion. Many of those states, salaries are not paid. Many of those states, nothing that government should do is being done. But everybody from the governor to the chief of staff, through all the ranks, were Christians. So dominion mandate is not to litter Christians all over the place. Christians will be all over the place if certain things are addressed first. If those things are not there, what we are doing are intelligent lectures. And so before God told the man to multiply, because you have to be careful what you are multiplying. Because it's not about the multiplication. What are you multiplying? What are you replenishing? That's why you cannot enter the dynamics until you deal with the essential aspect. You have to be careful what you are sending. What are you sending into all the worlds? Before Jesus sent them into all the worlds, he sat on them for three years. Because it's not just about sending. If it was about sending, Jesus would have sent people from the first day of his ministry. Because he had crowd all the time. Did you notice that of all the multitude that followed Jesus, at the end of the day, only 500 persons were sent. Because Jesus had 500 disciples, he had 120, he had 70, he had 12, he had 3, he had 1. Where are the multitude? Because in our own context of dominion, it's number. You come to media, we are the only people there. You come to government, we are the only people. But Jesus didn't think that way. Jesus had the multitude, he left them. And he selected those that he had incubated upon. Because dominion is not primarily number. Yes, number is a part of it. Because the glory of the king is in the multitude of the people. But what is the quality of the number? And so before we discuss the dominion mandate, we must find out who are the agents of dominion. The agents of dominion must first of all be born before we begin to discuss the dominion mandate. Because if you don't have agents of dominion, there is no mandate to execute. Jesus was with them for three and a half years. He never spoke about dominion mandate. He was interested in making agents because it's not Christians that execute dominion. It is witnesses. And there's a difference between a Christian and a witness. Make no mistakes about it. The whole Nigeria today can become Christians. There will be no dominion mandate. It is witnesses that carry the dominion mandate. And if you study from Genesis, there are five credentials that every Christian, every witness carries. These witnesses with these credentials are the ones that exercise and execute the dominion mandate. And when you study the Bible, I list them quickly as I begin to expound. Number one, Genesis. I want to begin from Genesis because it's the foundation. 
before we, we, we flow into other tributaries. Number one, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. He said, let us make man in our own image. The word image is the word for glory. And the glory of God is the essence of God. Is the nature of God. And so, a people that can exercise a do, the dominion mandate must be people that are dominated by the nature of God. Let us make man in our own image. You will notice that when the devil came, he didn't attack the mandate, he attacked the people. Because if the people are defied, the mandate is corrupt. No matter their number, it counts for nothing. And if you study Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The moment they fell short of the glory of God, if you like, have one billion of them, there's no dominion. No matter the activity they are doing, even if it is a spiritual activity, God will not be there. You can be doing church and God is not there. Because it is the nature that allows God to put his credibility upon what is going on. And so the first thing or the first qualification that a people must have before they begin to talk about the dominion mandate is the nature of God. Paul said, henceforth, know we know man after the flesh. Because if we know men after the flesh, they have no capacity to bring the dominion mandate. And so when you want to talk about the mandate, the dominion mandate, you are finding out who are you talking to? Is it somebody dominated by the flesh that is talking about dominion? That person can have the biggest company. That company will have nothing to do with God's kingdom. At the end of the day, it will only sponsor flesh further because you will study that person and discover his life is in the direction of vanity and it will become an act that will take many others in vanity. And so the first thing God checks, which is important and primary before you talk about the dynamics or the spheres of dominion is the nature of the people. Number two, he said, let us make man in our likeness. The word likeness is the word character, attitudes or expression, the ways of God. And so before you talk about dominion, a people must have been schooled in the spirit to a point where they think the thoughts of God and they live out the ways of God. If a man does not subscribe to the philosophy of the kingdom, he is not an agent of dominion. Give him 10 test books on the dominion mandate, he will not execute it because his ways are not the ways of God. If you study John chapter 8 verse 44, he say you are of your father, the devil. He said, the lust of your father shall ye do. Now, the people he was talking to were members of the Sanhedrin, Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees who carried very long beards, walking in the temple and putting burdens on people. But Jesus looked at them and said, you are sons of the devil. If you like, dominate the whole of Israel. The kingdom of God can't come here because what we are doing here is for your appetite. I'm not moved by how many of you are there. I'm moved by the quality of those of you who are there. And when, I, when he showed up, even though they were numerous, he couldn't see kingdom there. He said, you are of your father, the devil, because they operated by the, the frequencies of lust. They didn't adopt the ways of God. They didn't adopt the ideology and the philosophy of God. And in summary, the ways of God is selflessness and love. These people were self-centered and they were living for themselves. And so God could not be glorified. And so with such a people, they could be intelligent, but they could not carry the mandate of the kingdom. In fact, they, they pride in the laws of Moses. They were custodians of the laws of Moses. You are not a man until you can recite the laws of Moses and interpret it. So this is what gave them their honor in society. Nevertheless, when Jesus came, he wasn't moved about their intelligence. He looked at them and said, no, 
Your character is consistent with the devil. Your brain has what God says, but it's not reflective in your life. And so it's a waste to send you out. This is why Jesus left them and went for fishermen. You will think that this man already have influence in society. It would have been easy for Jesus to network with them and take over the systems. Even if Jesus hijacked the whole system, brood of vipers would have been in charge of the system and kingdom would not have come. And so when Jesus saw that these ones, these ones were in the likeness of the devil, he allowed them and went to the river bank and took peasants. He took people that had no relevance in society. I would rather put nature in these ones and send them out than to give knowledge to those who are serpents. Because the nature is superior to the influence. If the influence is there and the nature is wrong, you will still represent the spirit that has influence over you. And so Jesus went for fishermen. If the nature is right, right influence can be built over time. And so I'd rather go for nature than to go for influence. And he picked fishermen. People who were rejected in society and sent them to the nations. Number three, as you study along this line, you will discover the third thing that makes a man an agent of dominion is the presence of God. The Bible said in Genesis 3.8 that in the cool of the day, it said the voice of God came walking in the garden and day by day, God kept having intercourse with the man. And so a man who is a dominion agent is not in government. It's not in the economy. He's in the presence. It is in the presence he lives and it's in the presence he exists. It is from the presence that he affects the government. But if you take him out of the presence and plant him in the government, another spirit will take over him. Because men were created to live within the circumference of spirits. That's our habitation. We cannot live outside the reality of spirit. And the reason the presence is important is because there are three things the presence does. The first thing the presence does is that it mortifies. It is the presence that keeps flesh in check. If the presence is not there, the flesh will go on rampage. You are creative. You don't just know because you don't have money. Wait until they make you a senator. That's when you will notice that the way you walk is not correct. You, you have to change the way you walk. Because it no longer befits your status to walk simple. You don't know until you have a billion. That's when you understand that it is an error to spend a weekend in Lagos. Lagos is noisy. The best place to spend your weekend is the Bahama Islands. Because after the noise, you need to lie down on a blue beach and cross your leg and let air blow on you. And you will lie on that beach until you forget God. That's when you will discover that all these vital forms are fake. The only true bed is a water bed. The bed that massages. So when you lie on your bed, it should be rolling. It should be rolling. And they can bring seven beds. They will cancel all until you get the speck you are looking for. And so the only thing that can censor your flesh and keep it in check is a technology called the presence. Because when the presence comes, the presence mortifies the deed of the flesh and kills it. The job of the presence is to kill the flesh. Because the flesh cannot glory in the presence. Every time flesh wants to ascend, the presence kills it. It says flesh cannot glory in the presence. The Bible said Samuel killed Agag in the presence of God. What happens in the presence is a technology of the mortification of flesh. And so when a man steps out of, a, of the presence, he becomes an agent of another spirit. He may call himself a Christian. The second thing the flesh does is transformation. The flesh is what opens you up to the light and to the voice of God. The presence is what opens you up to the light and the voice of God. Because as you go into the world, you will find many spirits whispering. You will find many inspirations come to you. You don't need to read a book. Go and walk in the government. And then as you walk on a government facility, suddenly 
you will, inspiration will start coming. Inspirations. What you should do. How you should cut corners. How you should lobby. How you should compromise. They are there. The spirits are already there. They are gatekeepers. Go into the economic chamber. Find two billionaires coming. You will see the way you're, you will change. Even the way you greet them, you want to get their impression. Greeting will mean something else than salutation. Because when you greet them, you want to deceive them. The moment they talk to you, your, even your tone will change. You will add some, 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 you, you will add some things to your voice, you know, to, to, to get their attention. You will see that if another kind of light does not come to you, that it is not what man possesses that gives him value. If another kind of light does not come to you, that Christ in you is the hope of your glory, not a man. If another kind of light does not come to you, the territory will choke you with darkness. And so what the presence does is that it brings you into realms of illuminations. Those illuminations transform you and that's what keeps you accurate in a corrupt world. And the final thing the presence does is transfiguration. Is transfiguration. He said, we all, with open faces, beholding as in a glass, the image of the Lord. He said, we are changed. When Jesus stood on that mountain praying, he said, something happened. He said, the fashion of his countenance, Matthew 17, verse 2 and 3, was altered. There is a garment we have in the spirit. The more we tarry, the more that garment rests upon us. He was speaking about Moses earlier. As Moses was there for 40 days, a point came, the glory began to subdue the flesh and literally you could see it. You could see it because the presence brings out the God element on your inside. And so when you step out, you are no longer a representative of the Yoruba clan. You become a representative of a dimension in Zion. Because when we gather, we gather as representatives of different dimensions in God. That's why it's called the Ecclesia. Ecclesia because everyone here is a rep member and what you represent is a dimension in the spirit. When that dimension begins to take over you, it's called transfiguration. So you are no longer known after any fleshly tendency. You are known after that dimension. If these things don't happen, it's a risk to send men out there. They will be corrupt. They will be colonized by other spirits and you will find a Christian that became a senator he will not look anything like a Christian. You will find a Christian that became a businessman. He will not resemble anything like a Christian. Because you didn't bring them into the presence and teach them that they must remain there. That's what gives them the capacity to exercise the dominion mandate. Number four is life. In Genesis 2 verse 9 he said, God planted a tree in the garden. He called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, but there also, there was the tree of life. And so a man who is a witness and a carrier of the dominion mandate is a man who eats the life of God daily. He eats it. That is his bread. The reason is because what you eat is what increases the quality of your existence. If you don't eat for three days, you will be immobilized. If you don't eat for seven days, you can't go to the bank. If you don't eat for 14 days, you may end up in a hospital bed. Because this body survives by the food that comes from the earth. The same way, your spirit must survive on life. That's why even in eternity, he said, they that overcome, he shall give to eat of the hidden manna that is in the paradise of my God. That's the tree of life. We will eat it forever and ever. But you see, the way we eat life now is in capsules of revelation. The word of God is the bread of life that we eat now. And so when you find a man who will have the capacity to exercise the dominion mandate. It's a man that eats the world until he's saturated by it. He said, I found thy world and I did eat them and they became the joy and they rejoice. That's an economy in the spirit. Joy is an economy. Those who don't eat of the bread of life, they operate at the realm of happiness. 
and happiness is soulish. So when you give them a black jeep, ah, oh, that black jeep can turn them on for three days. When you say, take visa to Dubai, they are all over the place. But because it is happiness, it will quench. But when you begin to draw from the world and eat it, what happens to you is not happiness. It's called joy. And joy can make you happy. But over and above happiness, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That strength becomes stamina to stand against darkness. And so when you go to the office and everybody is taking bribe, you say, oh king, we will not be careful to answer you in this matter. We will not bow. And they will tell you, the fire is seven times hotter. It's not zeal that you use to confront fire. When you get to Babylon, you will know. Because what you call the government, there is Babylon there. What you call the banking sector, there is Babylon there. And many persons will bow. And if you refuse to bow, they will bring the furnace. The furnace. The stamina that you need to reject the furnace is not in your head. It's in your spirit. Because you will know that Nebuchadnezzar does not bluff. If he tells you, he will do it. Because if they don't bring the furnace, they will bring the den of lions. You will go through hell many times. Because many times, when they tell you to compromise and you refuse, they will put you in a pit for five years. Nothing will come. But even in that pit, they cut off everything. You will stand your ground. Because your strength is not your account. Your strength is the life that is in your spirit. The dominion mandate is not a lecture. It's a making process. The making process of warriors or warriors. This is why, see, we think the world, the world is just a place of speaking English. No, there are lions there. There are furnaces. There is the sun god called Pharaoh there. Pharaoh will lick you up with his anger unless you come with a momentum that you cannot understand. And the only thing that gives you that level of momentum is how much of the bread you eat. How much of life is in your spirit? That's your stamina. The Bible said in Galatians 1 verse 4, it called this word a wicked word, an evil word. In Psalm 74 verse 20, it called it the place of cruelty. It said the dark places of the earth, they are the habitation of cruelty. There is wickedness. As you go into government, you will be shocked that they call it Federal Republic of Nigeria, but you will find Babylon there. Babylon that will make you compromise every day. So when you live there, you would have done more harm than good. When you go, you will find Egypt. Egypt there. Egypt that will threaten you that you either leave your God or you don't go forward. And it's not a bluff. Sometimes they can put a spade in front of you and you don't make progress for five years. But you know, you know, that it's not the keda in government that defines you. It's not the keda. And so instead of bowing, you will stand your ground. And when the Lord turns again, the captivity of Zion, even that which was taken away, shall be restored. He said the hand of God came upon Elijah. He outran the chariots of Ahab. They may tell you to compromise and you refuse and they stop you for 10 years and you don't change your mind. On the 11th year, then God will bring a wind. And the promotion of 10 years will come in one day. But at that time, hear this. The testimony is no longer the promotion. The testimony is that you are bigger than the promotion. The dominion mandate is a life. It's a life. How much of it do you have? If not, Lagos will swallow you up. Lagos. You think Lagos is a geographical location. No. There are spirits here called Lagos. And what they do is to put pressure and anxiety in your soul. So you pursue money and you become religious but you are godless. <laughs> My God. Life is called stamina in the spirit. Stamina. When food doesn't come for one year, can you stand? When reproach comes for one year, can you stand?
when you are denied a position for five years, can you stand and say, Lord, I know you are able to promote me, but in case they think because of promotion, I will compromise. I will not. That's where the dominion mandate starts from. It's not a lecture. It's not English. It is war in the spirit. You think God just, God will cook you. All of this were at the bedrock. He didn't just come and say, have dominion. What are you multiplying? You are compromising and then you are in the economy. They say, God has a man there. No, it's the devil that has a man there bearing the name of God. Because what you are multiplying is compromise. It's iniquity. It's lies. It's bribery. That's not kingdom. The mandate does not begin with proliferation. The mandate does not begin with population. It begins with witnesses. And it's better to have 12 who are witnesses indeed than to have a million that the devil can scatter in a moment. Did you not read about the disciples of Jesus? They were killed. They stood their ground. When Peter was to be hanged on the cross they thought he would beg for his life he said please when you crucify me don't put it upward turn it upside down I'm not qualified to be crucified like my master if you have one of such men he's more than a million men go and read the church history and find out the kind of men that the dominion mandate is recited to it's not for everybody it's for witnesses. And these guys continued like that. The disciple of John called Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. He was 86 years old when they came to arrest him. And they told him to run. He said, no. Run to where? When his captors came, he sat them down and welcomed them and entertained them. When they finished, he said, let's go. I'm ready. I'm ready. That's the man you can send out. And when they were about to, 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 to burn him to the stake, they asked him to change his mind for the last time. And he said, for 80 and 6 years, my Lord has been good to me. Why will I deny him now? He said, go ahead. The Lord has given me strength to stand the heat of the fire. And he was burnt alive. And he never compromised. They spoke of perpetual and felicity this was a princess pregnant and arrested denied the master he said not me they said the child is innocent so let's wait until you conceive and every day she was counting down on her death and she never changed her mind few days after she was put to bed they carried her and her slave and took them to the arena naked and gave them one other choice to change their mind they said they will not and white beasts were released to tear them apart. You are changing your mind because of one million and you are talking dominion mandate. What dominion mandate? White beast tore them apart. They stood their ground. Our generation needs to find out again what makes a witness. Because only witnesses are dead enough to carry the weight of the dominion mandate. It's too heavy. For a man who is in himself to carry it. Is it this generation of gossipers? Is it this generation pursuing things, not God? There has to be an awakening first. If not, what we say will be lectures. This is a generation where young ladies fornicate to buy weak. A generation where men kill men for 4,000 naira. They will kill somebody, collect the money and go and eat a plate of food. To confront that kind of generation, you need the powers of the ages to come. You need something beyond English. You need something beyond intelligence. You need something beyond lingo. You need a witness in the spirit that when you speak, spirits are mobilized.
when you read church history, one thing you discover is that they don't write birth dates. Nobody celebrates birthday in the early church. They celebrate death days. Because they are interested how you die, not how you were born. Anybody can be born. But how did you go? Because how you go can become a memorial for the church. A memorial. They are more interested in how you left. Because how you left is a testament of how you lived. Because your death will validate your life. And so they were interested in raising people that were first of all willing to die for the Lord. Those were the kind of people they sent out to all the world. Our ascending thought nowadays is, is for its ambition. It's for ego. I'm doing well. Dominion. The word dominion is war. It means take over. And when you want to take over, you will meet the princes. And so when they come, you must be fortified with the nature, with the lifestyle, with the presence, and with the life. When this four is in place, then God will commission you with his authority. That authority is what we call the mandate. The authority that God places on you. And the goal of that authority is number one, to replicate the will of God where you find yourself. Your ability to replicate the will of God. Christians are not people looking for promotion or breakthrough. Christians are men sent to execute the will of God in different corridors. And so if you are in the government, what you are looking for is not a position to validate you. We don't have positions on earth. The earth has been judged. He said the elements of this world will melt. This earth has already been judged. When you are in government, you are there as a witness to bring the will of God. When you are in the economic world, you are there as an agent empowered with finances to bring the will of God. But you must first of all be conquered to be able to live and think that way. And so the reason we are having this session this morning is because one who trusts God to open the vistas of heaven so that we will see what every carrier of the mandate sees. Because the mandate is the authority on your life to administer God's will in your sphere of influence. But you cannot exercise God's will if you don't know it. And so when we are teaching on this subject, like most of the speakers would have taught and taught very well, is to open to you God's will for his people. Is to reveal to you God's will for territories and for dispensations and for generations. That's why somebody was quoting earlier that Pastor Poju said, it's good to have a lot of money. Not because that money gives you value, but because that money empowers you to advance God's kingdom. He said, cry out loud and say, my city's true prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. So one of the revelations of God's will is the fact that God wants his kingdom, which is the realm of his influence, to dominate the physical realm. And so if I come into this city, as God is growing me and my companies, my finances are growing, I'm looking for how to colonize Lagos. That's why the money is increasing. Not so that I will join Forbes list of the richest men in Nigeria. Because you can be a richest man in Nigeria and not be known in heaven. It will rather be that you open vistas through which men met God. Do you see how they do it in darkness? You click your phone, a naked woman pops up. You don't know who is paying for it. Billions of dollars going for that advert to be on every phone. Nowadays, if you even carry your writing pad, writing pad, you are not browsing. A naked woman will be walking in your writing pad. How did she come there? 
Because people who understand mandates of darkness are at work. You go to buy razor blade and you see a naked man with pant. How does a naked man concern a razor blade? Because those who have economic power have intentions of corrupting your soul. And they know the way your soul will corrupt is by looking upon pornography and nudity. And so their job is to sponsor it until every billboard you turn to, every Android phone you carry, every song you hear, they are dominating it. Now that they are advancing the game movement, billions of dollars are being pumped in every day in order to make it become a norm because they know that it's only this generation that will fight it. If they sponsor it well enough, the next generation coming will think it's normal. And so you go to the Olympics, you go to the World Cup, you go to the Premier League, you must see something about LGBTQ. They are not talking to you. They know you are brainwashed now. Enough to reject it. But they know your children don't know that much. And so if your children keep seeing it, your children will begin to think that the sex you have is not the sex you must have. Your sex is what you feel like you are. And so a man will come and say, I feel like a woman. And the reason he will feel that way and talk that way is because right from his conception, right from the first time he can articulate, those who sponsor it with their wealth have sponsored enough for him to see and think it's normal. In Europe now, they are teaching four-year-old children that they have the right to choose the sex they want. And those who are in government insisted that it should be done. Whereas Christian politicians are in government and all they are interested in is how to cut away with the billions that is meant for their constituency to buy Ferraris and pack in their compound. One senator has five houses in five countries. Do you live in five countries? But lost. Lost. And so our problem is not absence of Christians in corridors where it matters. It's absence of witnesses. We have more than 40 Christian senators. If they are kingdom people, they are enough to represent us. And so don't tell me dominion mandate is about populating different spheres with Christians because we already have more than enough but we don't have witnesses and it's not about the senators even on the street those who are selling corn are thieves and so the syllabus must be re-examined and people must come to know that before you talk about kingdom advancement, talk about the people. Who are you? What is the measure of the nature at work in your life? What is the measure of the character on display through your life? What is the depth of the presence you have sucked yourself into? What is the level of life that you have eaten from the world? Do you date a woman wants to marry? She's looking for a man with a big chest. She doesn't care what God says. How many of them even hear God? They hear chest size. A man wants to get married. He's looking for a woman with a big buttock. In an era where princes are going to war, you don't know the, the nobles marry for kingdom. For kingdom. Why do you think oh, every man is under pressure to increase the size of his chest? It's not for health purpose. It's for looks purpose. Health purpose, good. But your market value increases if your chest is bigger. And so when they build it and you are not noticing it, they remove all they wear and wear only tight shirt so that they, it can come out well. So the goal of the building is for beholding. And this person has no muscles in the spirit. It's lanky in the spirit. Every woman
woman wants to be naked. Ah, ah. When did they change the definition of beauty to nakedness? I thought nakedness was different from beauty. When did they modify the definition? You now know that other demons and princes are at work. They are whisperers. There's nothing wrong in being excellent, but there's everything wrong in being naked. And when the generations begin to go naked, know that the Deborahs are lacking. And so the kingdom mandate is your ability to receive God's authority and use that authority to exercise God's will. And so there are few spiritual ways of accessing God's will. And God's will is a plethora of spiritual realities that I cannot begin to explain here. But God's will finds expression where whatever it is you are doing makes the people to contact God contain God and express God. If you are able to achieve that, you've given expression to God's will and you have carried out the dominion mandate. Wherever God places you, if you are able to make men contact God, contain God and express God, then that's the summary of God's will. It can be in government, it can be in media, it can be in the economy, wherever you are, it can be in the educational field. If you are able to get men, either directly or indirectly, to contact God, contain God, and express God, you have done God's will. But there are many channels into this ability and this reality. One of them is by spiritual impartation. And that's what we'll be trusting God for in the next 10 minutes. Let me show you a few scriptures quickly as we begin to round up. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. You can bring people into God's will by teaching them. You can bring people into God's will by praying and impacting them. You can bring people into God's will by bringing them under the atmosphere of those who are living out God's will. So there are many channels. But for tonight, God's servant said we should trust God for activations. And so I need to read a few scriptures to support what I want to do. So when we start praying, you will know exactly what is happening in the spirit. And so Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, here was Paul trying to bring a people into God's will. Because as we live here, most of us will also be saddled with the responsibility of bringing others into God's will. And this is one of the most potent ways of achieving it. Because there are many places you will go, it is illegal to preach to somebody. There are many places you will go, it will be informal to preach to somebody. You don't go to the bank and say, everybody come and hear the gospel. They will sack you the next week. And so, in places where you can't preach, like we have the liberty doing now, there is another channel through prayer and impartation. Prayer can culture an atmosphere and when people enter, that atmosphere begins to educate them. That's the dynamic. Because spirits are mobilized through prayer. And so when you choke a place with prayer, the spirits begin to work. Because you hear with many frequent faculties beyond your ear. Every cell in your body hears. That's why if you enter a room where two people are quarreling, even if they stop talking, you will know. You are, you are a receptacle of frequencies. And so one of the ways you bring people into God's will is by prayer and impartation, especially when their hearts are open. And so Colossians 1 9 says, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of your faith, we did not cease to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. If you go forward, he said that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God's will. This is when somebody can go into the academia and say he's carrying the dominion mandate. 
when he's fully pleasing to God, when he is fruitful in making others contact, contain, and express God, because he's known the specific will of God for him in that territory. But the way he comes into this economy is by prayer. And so some of the people that will be impacted this morning, they will not fall down. But as they go to their business on Monday, they will enter that business as a new person. Because before now, they went as earners of salary. But now they will enter there as ambassadors of Zion. Because something would have happened. They would have discerned God's will. And the more you discern God's will and leave it out, the more authority is imparted on your life. But the way you get in is by prayer and by impartation. Number two, I show you something else. Ephesians 1 from verse 17 to 19. Hear what Paul said. See, this prayer thing, huh, if you are a believer, pray. He does so much to, for you than God just opening the door. He said, he prayed for the church in Ephesus. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant unto them. See the robust dynamics that Paul was about to open to this church through prayers to show you the authority of prayers. See what Paul was about to open. And being a technocrat, he knew exactly what he was doing. He said, number one, that God may give unto you, on the strength of his prayer, the spirit of wisdom. That's Sophia. And revelation. That's apocalypse. In the knowledge of him, that's epignosis. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that's fortizo. So one prayer provoke four things. That's why impartations are important. If I'm teaching you, I can bring you revelation. And you are limited to the revelation. But when I pray over you, I bring you much more than revelation. Sophia is knowledge that produces result. That's why it's called wisdom. Fruitful knowledge. So that job you are on, you will not go on that job and say, I'm a spiritual man. I'm a spiritual man. Or God, you were employed to teach physics. Before you are a witness in that university, you must know physics and teach it where. You can't go into the economy and say, we are apostles to the economic world. And you don't have intelligence for the trading. They will kick you out. You cannot go into the medical corridor. Every operation you do, the patient dies. And then you say, we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors. No, no, no. You have to be fruitful and effective there first. You can't go to the market and they give you 10 million. After three months, it becomes 300,000. And they say, no, you are unprofitable. You say, come on. I'm a servant of God. Don't you know we are here to change the market? Oh God, before you change the market, improve the market. And so Paul said they needed to have Sophia knowledge that produces results. And then number two, he said apocalypse. That means access into the secrets of that realm. And so while you are in the market trading intelligently, a point will come, you will know that that market is not just a market of trading, it is a battleground. Because when access begins to come, you will start seeing signatures of principalities and powers, of rulers of the darkness of this world and of spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So you will not just go into that market with knowledge anymore. You will now go into that market with weapons of warfare. And so when you come to the market, before you open the door, you sit in the room and blow in tongues for one hour. You will not have the momentum to pray in tongues for one hour before starting, except as your eyes are open. Maybe what you call your shop, you come and then your eyes are open. You now discover there is a dark cloud on your shop. That's when you will know that what is happening here is beyond trading. What is happening here is war. When you see that kind of reality, then the momentum to pray is imparted. Because now, that vision will equip you with capacity for war. The reason many people are not fighting is because they've not seen. The reason Moses did what he did 
the Bible said it was because he saw him that was invincible. If you don't know that the family is a corridor warfare, you will think it's about speaking politely to your wife and going on periodic holidays from Spain to Dubai. But when you discover that there is a program that they've written, that after 14 years in marriage, then the first attack will come. When you are 10 years in marriage, you will start adding tongues. Because you will know that to be able to dodge that arrow, four years later, you will need a knot of preacher momentum to ascend. Because the devil doesn't fight every day. He doesn't have enough weapons. That's why he prepares specific weapons for specific people. He said, no weapon fashioned against you. He doesn't have too much. So the devil can decide to invade your space every four, four years. If you don't have apocalypses, you will not prepare. Because you traded this year, made 10 million. Traded next year, made 30 million. Traded next year, made 200 million. You say, we have arrived. Meanwhile, your battle is on the 40th. But if you have apocalypses from the first year, you will know that it's not the victory of the first, second, and third year. The victory of the fourth year is what matters. And so before you reach the fourth year, you will enter there with weapons. Belele, lala, yuata, vavara, kakatano, baradadia, juata. You see why many people fail in life? They don't have apocalypses. They have seven years of glory. They don't know that the next seven years is famine. It will take a Joseph that has access to revelation to tell you, oh king, don't live carelessly in the first seven years. After the first seven years, the next seven years will be famine. Apocalypsis is what fortifies you with strategic knowledge for strategic engagement. And then when you finish Apocalypsis, he now spoke about Fortizo. Fortizo is illumination. At the level of Fortizo, you don't have access anymore. You carry it from where it is and brings it out. Authority level has changed. Apocalypsis brings you into the realm. Fortizo makes you carry the realm out. And so why one person is seeing something for one year or for two years and is preparing, another person doesn't need to see it. He is the answer. Anywhere he comes, he comes with authority. Listen to Daniel's life. Once upon a time, the king called Daniel and said, I had a dream. If you can tell me the dream, I will believe your interpretation. Because he came to realize that his astrologers were liars. So before you give me any fake interpretation, tell me the dream first. So they needed apocalypses at that level. And Daniel said, there's a God that reveals secret. Give us time. As Daniel went to pray, access was granted him. But a point came, Daniel grew. The next time, the other king called him. He didn't need to pray anymore. Now he is the realm. He doesn't enter the realm. He is the realm. He is the realm. And when Daniel showed up, he said, Oh king, God exalted you and gave you a kingdom that covered the ends of the earth. But you decided to worship the God of iron, of stone and of clay. See, when you have become the realm, even the way you talk change. Because when you speak, things happen. You don't need to prepare for four years to collide with that issue. If that issue sees you coming, it will move for its, for its own good. He said, you have decided to worship the God of stone, of clay, and of iron. He says, it's for this reason that this hand is come. Mene, mene. Ah! Whenever I remember this scripture, something is quickened in my spirit. There was nobody who could read that handwriting. Because that was the first time the mystery of tongues came into the earth realm. That's why Paul called it the language of angels. Nobody knew anything about tongues before that time. And a mortal man showed up and was reading the handwriting of angels. Mene, mene. Teke, ofasi. He didn't just read it. He now began to interpret it. So you know the language of angels. The question now is, 
Where does Daniel live? Does he live on earth or he lives in heaven? How did he come to know angelic language so much? And he did not just interpret it. He executed the judgment. He said, tonight, my God, it's called fortizo. When a man carries light. Now, if you don't carry light, you cannot exercise the will of God. Because the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1, it said, darkness shall cover the earth. It said, gross darkness, the people. Gross darkness. That business you are going into, there is darkness there and there is gross darkness on the people. So you can't just come there and say, I'm a Christian. No. You must come with light. Because he said, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. Even Jesus, the Son of God, was on earth for 30 days. No impact. Kingdom doesn't move because you are present. Kingdom moves because you have light that comes with authority. After light came to him, in Matthew 4, 15, he said, the land of Zabulu, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. He said, the people that sat in darkness, they have seen a great light. That means all his work in Zabulu for 30 years had no impact on the territory until light came. And Paul says, the way this light is activated is by prayers. He said, I pray for you that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him will come. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Somebody is going back to the economic world with light. Somebody is going back to government with light. Because that light will do two things to you. The things the devil wants to shroud away from you so that you don't prosper, you will know it. Because the Bible said that the reason God created mysteries is for our glory. And so when you go into the economic world, there is a demonic intelligence where they hide the opportunities. They hide the connections. They hide the advantages for you not to be able to see. When light come, they comes, the first thing that happens is that you go ahead of them. So what they plan for your evil turns out for your good because you can counter all their steps. But beyond that, when light comes, you now also have authority to judge them. I pray for somebody here this morning. The authority that light confers to be able to exercise the will of God, it rests upon you now. Do you know what will happen if 50 of us in Lagos carry light? Light. This city will be shut down. It will... Did you not read about Paul? Only two men enter the city. He said, this be the man that turned their world upside down. The Bible said, Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there and the whole city was full of joy. That means our potential is equivalent to cities. Every man is supposed to be a city in the spirit. That's why he said you are a light. A city set upon a hill. Every man is actually a city. And when God is rewarding men, he rewards them with cities. He say, you have been faithful, so I give you authority over 10 cities. How come 100,000 of us are in one city we can't take over? It's because there is no light. When light comes, everyone becomes equivalent to a city. I pray for you this morning. The capacity to become a city, take it down. When you celebrate that you have a good job, it's good because you appreciate God. But you are bigger than a job. You are a city. And so when you enter any sphere, you come with new civilization. You come with new government. You come with new operational system. You come with new powers to change that place because you are a city. I decree over you the capacity of a city. Receive it now. We are not at the mercy of the sons of the bond women. No. We are the light of the world. They are not. 
as this conference is over, there will be a reassignment of functionaries. Some of you, God will begin to send to the academia. Some of you, he will send to the media. Some of you, he will send to the economics. Some of you, he will send to government. But now you know you are an ambassador. And so the authority to take over, receive it now. Moses was one man. He took Egypt. Daniel was one man. He took Babylon. Jonah was one man. He took Nineveh. John was one man. He took Jerusalem. Philip was one man. He took Samaria. Received the power to take Lagos. He said, according as it is written, he said, they believe and have spoken. He said, we having the same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore we speak. He said, God is not a respecter of persons. If Moses could do it, if Daniel could do it, if Philip could do it, then you too can do it. And so in this conference, the capacity to do, receive it now. Hear this. If this thing does not take number, if only few of us can do it, what now will happen if all of us can do it? You know, I began by telling you it's not about number and population. It's about stature. But nobody says all of us should not have stature. So if 10 of us can do it, what now happens if we are 100,000? The Bible said in Zechariah 10 verse 1, ask of me rain in the time of the latter rain. He said, I will cause bright cloud and showers on every blade of grass. He said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, he said, there rested upon them cloven tongues as of fire and it affected all of them. I decree everybody here, both in this hall and online, and those who will hear later, receive that grace now. Just lift your hands toward heaven now. I'm hearing in the spirit, my time is over. There's an anointing that is about to rest on some of you for enthronement. We are kings. We are priests. That's why we rule. There's an anointing that is about to rest. Some of you have, your life has been so tight, even up till now. But hear this. He said he lifted the beggar from the dung heap. When God is speaking, he goes to the worst case scenario so that you can factor yourself in. And he said he sent his word to Jacob, he lightened upon Israel. There's an anointing that is about to come on people now. An anointing for enthronement. The king, the kingly anointing for territorial dominion. I just want you to be sensitive now. Because that anointing will come upon some of you in the similitude of fire. Fire. Take that fire. Ushers, please help them. I don't want it too energetic because we are out of time. We may miss lose track of time. Please find for me seven people randomly that the hand of God will come upon now for exhortation. When you are made a king, everything meets you. A king doesn't hustle. A, a king does not need to run around. When a man is enthroned, everything meets him. I decree now, at least seven of them. Seven is the number of perfection. Take that fire. Take that fire. Take that fire. Balakadosh. Bring 
Kenya. Belele. Wale la vata. Sasa tanatalish. Walak. Help them. Bring those under the anointing. Bring them quickly. You don't have to be an usher if God is touching somebody so they don't injure themselves. Help them quickly. Bring them to the front where we have space here. And just allow God to keep working on them. The Holy Ghost is telling me now that it's about to lighten the understanding of men. Hear this. There is the eye that sees. Not every eye sees. Opportunities are not glaring. They are heat. It takes a seen eye to find opportunities and when you can access opportunities you are empowered now the Lord wants to wash the eyes of people so they can see opportunities and those opportunities will become channels of power and authority for them wherever you are please lift your hands toward heaven in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus the Bible said the house of the Lord kept going up by the prophesying of Zechariah the son of Edo. The reason we speak like this is because we build and we create by talking. Somebody's eyes are about to be enlightened. Opportunities are not public. They are not glaring. Only few you find them. And if you begin to find opportunities, something happens. You will take over. I pray now and I decree now the fire that burns the scales, the fire that punches the eyes, the fire that opens the eye. Take that fire now. Take that fire. Ushers, help them. Take that fire. There is a fire that punches. It opens your eyes. It punches your eyes. See. See what others cannot see. You see, as far as your eyes can see, I have given unto you. Now see. Now see. Now see. Wherever the fire to, shed the devour, shed the devour, shed the devour. Yaradana. Hear this. Authority is not a fluke. If you have it, you have it. But two things that every man of authority always possesses is a seeing eye and a hearing ear. He say, as far as your eyes can see, I've given unto you. He say, I prophesied as I was commanded. When a man can see and hear, he has authority. Now, God is opening the eyes of people to see. I stretch hands over you now. Every eye blinded here 
in the name of Jesus I command it open so channels of my spirit open up I am with the Father open up no boundaries no limits limit. open up let it call on to deep let it call on to Now hear this. The Lord wants to take men higher. But he says it is going to be based on their priesthood. Hear this. Please hear me. We are priests and kings. But it's always important to know that we are priests before we are kings. Our kingship operates on our priesthood. If there's no priesthood, there will be no kingship. And so the Lord is telling me now, power on the altar is about to rekindle somebody's altar that has gone obsolete. I pray for you now. I pray for you now. I pray for you now. Let the fire on your altar be rekindled. Let the fire be rekindled. Let the fire be rekindled. The fire, the fire is resting upon some of you now. The fire, the fire, the fire, the fire. Imola de, imola de. Help them, help them, help them. Your lives will never be the same again. I try to compress a lot of things because of time. But get this. Three things you must know about the dominion mandate. It's number one, there's a dynamic. Number two, there are spheres. And number three, there is the organic makeup protocol. The dynamic is the blessing and the multiplication that follows. The spheres are the earth realm, the water realm, the atmospheric realm, and the spirit realm. The seven mountains of influence are controlled from these realms. And the makeup protocol insists that in you must be the nature of God, the likeness of God, 
the presence of God, the life of God, and the authority of God. Because the dominion mandate is your ability to contact God, contain God, and express God. And whichever sphere you find yourself, it's your ability to make the people contact God, contain God, and express God. I pray for you today. Everyone under my voice, both in this hall and online, or those who we hear later, the power to exercise the dominion mandate, receive it now. And you will never diminish in the exercise of this mandate. For the part of the just is as a shiny light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. I decree as you exercise this mandate, it will be from glory to glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Let it be light. Let it be light.